Awesome. Thank you. Um, thank you to our guest today, who is also our host. Um, so um, before, as a way of introducing, um, before we can get to something, you just said something uh, very interesting. You said a sofer stam. Sofer means scribe in Hebrew. Uh, what does stam mean? Can you, can so, you give us, explain that for us? Yeah, so stam is an acronym. Mm -hmm. um, and it stands for the sacred writings that a scribe is trained to write. So I will put in the chat box um, how you write it. This is in English, stam. In Hebrew, it's samech tav mem. And it stands for Sefer Torah, the book of Torah, or the scroll of Torah, tefillin, and mezuzah. And the mem also stands for megillah, like megillah to stare. So those are the, those are the four main um, objects, sacred objects that scribes are trained to write. Excellent. So, so there are sacred objects. So um, you're not just a calligrapher in the sense that you are actually a sacred, what you're doing is you're in the process of writing sacred texts. So how did you decide one day to like, you woke up and you're like, I'm going to write sacred texts? Pretty much. <laughs> how long ago was this? This was um, about 14 years ago, 13 wow. or 14 years ago. Um, I was, I think, 31. And I it actually very, it was very much like that. It was um, kind of a light bulb went off sensation. I was visiting Israel, I was on a short trip, and I was walking down the street. And the thought hit me, I, I want to learn how to write the letters. You know, I knew I knew how to write Hebrew, um, like in script, but I did not know how to write the Hebrew letters as they're written in the Torah, for example. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a, a decision or a thought that I wanted to be a scribe. It was just that I wanted to learn. Um, and then it sort of dominoed after that. So um, walk me through the process of what it takes to, um, to train as a scribe and then to train as a scribe for sacred texts. Meaning what's the difference between learning the calligraphy and then what is the, the sacredness level added to that piece? Okay, so the, the word scribe, I think, would be attributed to someone who is writing the sacred, sacred writings. As a person, and otherwise, as a calligrapher. It, would, it would be called a calligrapher, a Hebrew calligrapher. So for the sacred writing, there is one, there is a certain alphabet that you learn. It's called Ashurit. And Assyrian it goes, script. Assyrian, exactly. And so I, if for anyone that was there on Shavuot, I taught about the evolution of early Hebrew scripts. This Assyrian script, Ashuri, is not the earliest Hebrew, though we think of it as quite ancient. It is not the most ancient, but it is the script that we use for sacred writings. And um, so all the scribes are trained in that script. Now, there are many different styles of Ashuri. So if you look at different um, Torahs from different places and different time periods, they will not all look the same. They, were, they will stylistically be, they can be quite different. Um, however, they're all this particular, alpha, this particular alphabet. Um, whereas Hebrew calligraphy could be written in, in any manner. So, um, you know, it could be, a, it could just be in different styles. And then on top of that, if you're doing, if you're writing sacred writings, they're, are a lot of other rules um, that go into the writing. So um, one very basic rule that, um, that applies to all aspects of the writing, or all aspects really of, of, the, of the entire project, so even from the moment of preparing the parchment, there is an intention that goes in. So the person preparing the parchment and the person that's doing the writing not only has to think about the fact that they are writing sacred writings to be used um, as such, but actually have to say a statement out loud. So the person preparing the parchment says out loud, I am preparing these skins to be used for sacred writing. And similarly, a scribe, before they, are, before they begin to write a mezuzah, for example, they say, I am writing for the sake of the holy mezuzah. So you learned the scripts, you, you, were, you learned the technical proficiency of how to do the scripts, and then you also learned the halachot, the laws of being ascribed separately. Exactly. Um, this was and they're interrelated because there are halachot that are 
connected to the manner in which you you write the, the letters. Not that they have not that there are certain stroke orders, but um, there are a few rules that that do address how the writing is. So 14 years ago, this must have been pretty rare for a woman to want to do this. Yeah, I didn't realize when I <laughs> I didn't realize when I uh, had the thought, oh, I want to learn this. I grew up um, thanks to the women and the feminists that came before me that I, I just thought everything, women did everything. And uh, I, it didn't occur to me that women weren't yet really doing this. And when I say weren't doing this, I, I mean, there were some women who had learned and were practicing, but very few. Um, we're talking like a handful. Um, and that it really, that no kind of revolution had happened in the same way that, for example, there were, when I grew up, there were already women who were rabbis. Um, and now, of course, many women are rabbis. And, and it has not, not in all communities is that the case, but I, there's been a major shift. Whereas for people that write sacred writings, for scribes, there has not yet been that major shift. Um, I had, you know, when I, when I asked around for a teacher, when I, I actually, I learned a bit on my own. I just found information online and I, I, for a few months, I just kind of figured things out a little bit. And then I realized that I needed someone to guide me and I asked around for names and I kept getting the same two names and they were people that were two or, and three hours away from me. And I thought, wow, that's unusual. Are there that, are there that few people that can teach this or are willing to teach women. And it, and it really, it was the case. And, and the community has grown somewhat. I'm now part of a small, uh, we're not a collective exactly, but we're loosely associated with each other um, of mostly women uh, scribes. Amazing. Um, so uh, maybe if we can address that before we get into the practicalities. Um, is there any, uh, I assume that there's no technical difference between the, the writing of a woman versus the writing of a man. From a halachic perspective, um, what are the advantages, limitations of being a woman, for example, from a traditional perspective versus from a liberal perspective, anything along those lines? Interesting. I, I love how you phrase that question. What are the advantages? Um, honestly, there, there is, I, th I have experienced an advantage in that I think there is a thirst from many communities to have women doing their doing this writing or um, you know being part of their communities in you know in for example if they want to commission a safer Torah to have someone come in and help you know and and help the community members write letters participate do education um, there's an excitement about having a woman do that so that has been an advantage I think I got early on opportunities that I would not necessarily have gotten, ironically. Um, but on the other hand, there are issues. It's not, um, it's not universally, a, for example, a Torah that I will write will not be universally accepted as a kosher Torah. Um, and also, for example, I will have sometimes difficulties buying supplies. If I go into one of the stores and they sense that I'm going to be doing the writing. You know, they might think at first, oh, I'm buying the parchment for my husband or my brother or my father. But if they, real if they realize that it's me, they might, they might choose not to sell to me. And in fact, we have, women have to, we have to be choosy and careful like where we go to buy the supplies. So there are people that you, are there people that you know will actively sell you the supplies or? Yes. The okay. So um, you brought something up there that traditionally, there are, there are traditional communities that wouldn't accept necessarily a sacred Torah written from you. And I remember asking a very observant uh, scribe friend of mine, I said, how would, like, if a sacred Torah written by a woman is released into the wild, like, how does it then, like, what happens? And how would you know if you're buying a Torah that it was written by a woman or not? And he told me something really fascinating. And I don't know if you have this in the liberal side of things also. He said that they're in the, amongst the Haredi, the, the really ultra-Orthodox or the very Orthodox community of scribes, they have a guild. And the guild has handwriting samples of every single individual scribe that is a member of that guild. And if you have a question as to where this, um, this Torah came from, you can send a sample of the, of the Torah scroll itself, like a photograph, and they will match it against any of the other 
handwriting samples. And I was like, really, they can actually tell? I was like, because it all looks the same to me. He goes, no, no, scribes know each other's handwritings, like backwards and forwards, inside and out. And so can you tell, like, for example, your loose connection of, you know, scribes that you are friends with, can you tell who wrote something without even knowing what it was? Uh, yes. Mostly. I mean, the ones whose writing I know. So that's, that's very interesting. That's fascinating that, because like there, it's something that most people, when they open up a Torah, they, all the, the writing seems like the same to them. And then you like the, to the people that know, they're like, oh no, 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 that's that person's writing or that's that person's writing. Right. I suspect that anyone who looked side by side at five Torahs would also be able to distinguish between the writing. It's just that <laughs> We, we see them generally speaking one at a time, and so we think that they all look the same. This actually is one of the most fascinating things to me about the way that we create Sifrei Torah, which is that every single one is unique. And in fact, the only way to identify a Torah is to look at the, is to look at the handwriting. I mean, that's, the, that's really the only way that we can, um, let's say, for example, we wanted to you know, have insurance on a Torah. Um, how would we know that this Torah that was stolen or got lost and then it was found, how would we know that it was the one that was lost? The only way really to know is to do, is to look at the writing and to do a comparative sample of a picture of the writing. Um, and in terms of, in terms of recognizing our writings, um, the other, the other uh, stem. So I was part of a project um, actually in not, is, are, you from, are you in Toronto? I'm in Montreal. Oh, you're, you're in Montreal. Okay, so this is for a community in Toronto. It was a group Torah. So five women together wrote a Torah. Each one of us wrote one of the books. And when we sewed it together and scrolled through, you could very, very easily tell, oh, we just, we just went from Shoshana to Hana to me. And our handwritings are, are quite different. And even if even if a person wants to imitate someone else's writing, it is quite difficult, right? People try to forge documents um, and some, some succeed, but if you're very good and you, you can analyze, you, you really cannot, it's, it's kind of like a fingerprint. Amazing. Um, so yeah, it's one of those things that I think most people don't think about when they do deal with that. The other, I remember the other thing is I had a, um, a woman that was a sofera that's in my, it's in my community. Um, and I asked her, I said, you know what, like maybe you can't write tefillin or a mezuzah for me because, you know, I'm Orthodox and I, I respect the work that you're doing and I'm not going to, I'm not going to use it, but maybe you can at least check my tefillin. And she told me that she could check my tefillin, but even the act of sewing up the tefillin would be something that a Orthodox individual would want to be done by an Orthodox male only. And so that would be a problem. And then I asked her, maybe she could teach me how to sew up the tefillin so that I could do it myself and then she could check it. And, and at some point it just started, the, the process started getting a little, a little complicated. So I said, <laughs> I, I'm going to respect the work you're doing. I'll commission you to do something else for me someday, but we'll, we'll keep the two separate or whatever. Um, so that's, so, so there are a lot of distinctions between the things that you can do um, and while that closes you off from certain segments of the market, it opens you up to other segments of the market. Exactly. Uh, amazing. So um, is this your full-time job? Well, uh, no, I work with my Jewish learning. I'm hosting, <laughs> <Amazing. laughs> I'm hosting these, uh, these Zoom sessions, um, which were launched, um, you know, in response to COVID-19 and uh, in a lockdown. It, Prior to that, it had been my full-time job for over a decade. What does the day-to-day -day life of a sofer or soferet look like? It, they, every day looks much the same. Um, the content is slightly different. So I, uh, sofrim do different kind, focus on different kinds of work. So some sofrim work mostly on Torah repair, for example. Some write primarily mezuzot and tefillin. I primarily write new Sifrei Torah, though I also work some in Torah repair. Um, the reason I prefer Torahs has to do with certain, uh, the manner in which they're written, and maybe we'll get into that later, Avi. Um, but Torahs take a long time. Um, it takes me about a, a year and a half, because I do a little bit of, you know, I do some education also in between, um, maybe a Megillah, 
throw in a Megilla, why not? Um, and so the day to day looks like uh, I look at, you know, I write a column a day and um, I look at the passage, I sit down at my writing desk and I, I begin. It's, you know, it's meditative, um, but not necessarily in the sense that people who maybe don't, I'm, I'm not a meditator, but I think my sense is that people who don't meditate think it's all like relaxing and nice. It's not necessarily that. It just, it, but it, you know, it, it, it's interesting. It like it, you're aware of, you become aware of your thoughts. So when I am writing a Sefer Torah and I have other thoughts come in, I have to refocus on the task at hand, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, but it, it's kind of like anything else in, in life, um, you know, uh, some days are easier than others. Some days are, are harder. There's not, not necessarily a reason why, but it's, it's definitely very intensive work, though it's, it's pretty, it's also stable in the sense that it, nothing that much changes, right? The work itself is, is pretty much the same all the time. So um, a couple things on that, that whole thing. So um, how many, so then just to give a sense of people for like what that means, how many hours of writing is it to take in a day to write one column? Not counting in the breaks, meaning if you just focused on the writing itself, what would that look like? Just the writing, not the breaks. Um, somewhere between four and five, four and five hours. Excellent. So that's, that gives you a sense of, you know, how long one of those columns yeah. actually does. And I can, show, I can show um, a column of Torah. That would look amazing. Yes. Okay, I'll be, I'll, Go, go while, you do that, the, while you do that, I'm going to explain it. something and you can hear what I'm about to say. Um, I remember doing a workshop with a scribe. Uh, I've, I've been fascinated by scribal arts for many, many years myself. I actually collect uh, calligraphy as much as I can, both secular and sacred. And I've bought um, uh, uh, graffiti. And, and the, the act of writing is, is very, very fascinating to me, especially writing that's turned into art. So, so I'll, I'll preface it by that. But I remember going to a writing workshop with a scribe. And they had us sit down and um, use a quill and write out one sentence in Hebrew from a, from a chumash and using the, the letter forms. And of course, I don't know how to write these letter forms necessarily, but I had the guide to show me how to do it. And I had done, you know, a few lines of it previously and I've, I've worked with it and I know how the Hebrew works, um, but it still took me like a half an hour to write out, you know, one verse. And yes. the act of writing that one verse, and this was like the entire intention of the workshop was not so much to show us how to write the letters, but to show us what goes on in your mind, right? To read a verse takes about five seconds, right? To translate a verse might take five minutes. To handwrite a verse might take, you know, a minute to three minutes, but to write it out in this very highly stylized, very specific way takes about a half an hour. And the act of doing that means that you're spending so much time and so much thought on it. Right. So it, if you practice more, it would no longer take you half an hour to do one line. Clearly, but it's but still it's thoughtful still, and the idea of doing all that. So this is the Ten Commandments. Is this, this is the, the Ten Commandments. I can't That's see. Is that the Ten Commandments from, from Shemot or from Devarim? I believe it's Devarim. Yes. No, it's, no, it's oh, no. Shemot. It's Shemot. See. It, the, the, okay, good. Because <laughs> my, my Bar Mitzvah Parsha is from a Devarim, so I always okay. have that. That connection and i can sort of sense where it is but beautiful so that Thanks. whole column would take you about a day a day so and then two hours of there, writing in the morning two hours in the afternoon i actually uh, no i finish you, early i do you do yeah, it like it's morning and afternoon pre and post lunch okay it. um so yeah this is what was i going to say about this um Right. So, so it would go, it would go fast. It would go faster as you, as you progressed. Yes. So, but it would still, the, the act of, if I had to handwrite a column, it would not take me five hours, meaning just in freehand script, it would probably take me right. half an hour, yes. but the act of writing it so slow is meditative and forces you to focus on the writing and, and the letters in such a special, in such a different way, um, which leads to my next question. And you okay. can put that I'm away listening. in the meantime while you while you listen. Um, it's clear to me then that you cannot be a um, ignorant of the meaning, meaning you have to be fluent in Hebrew really to be a scribe. 
um, because the act of writing it is not just mimicking and parroting out words and doing letter forms, it really, it takes an intense focus on the meaning of the words in order to be able to pass it out there. Right. You do need to know Hebrew. That is one of the rules. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's funny. It's ironic because in some respects, you are less likely to make a mistake if you don't know Hebrew. And I'll explain what I mean. Someone who knows Hebrew is much more likely to mix up certain letters that have the same sound um, or to spell something. Sometimes in the Torah, words are spelled in atypical ways that they are more typically spelled. So to make spelling errors of that nature or to add a word that makes logical sense as you're saying the verse. Um, so a person who was just purely copying the symbols would actually be less likely to make a mistake. However, they would not be also transmitting the meaning and, and taking part in the, the process of the transmission of the content of the Torah. So that's, that's, that's yeah, an element. Of that's Torah. fascinating. So I have a few questions from um, Nancy here. Uh, first of all, she says calligraphy, not graffiti. I, I do believe that calligraphy and graffiti are very closely intertwined and one should not knock one simply because it comes from a certain place and not the other. Um, there is beautiful meanings to be had from graffiti as much as there is from, from calligraphy. Um, she wants to know uh, a, how the ink is made and people that are vegan and vegetarian have issues with the parchment. Um, so we can get into that and then we can move back towards the Hebrew and towards the other pieces there. Okay, so maybe I'll take a step back and explain about the parchment. Um, the parchment is, here's a sample of parchment. Mm -hmm. um, you can't feel it, it feels a little bit fuzzy. It is animal skin that is processed, kind of like leather except it's not tanned. Um, and it has to be made from a kosher species. So mostly today this is cow because there are many, many cows. Um, it could be sheep, it could be goat, which by the way, you can tell a goat Torah if you, uh, if you smell it, if you smell the parchment, you will know that that is goat skin. <laughs> it will smell very goaty. Um, and, and also deer. So some people don't even think of deer as a kosher species. It is kosher, however, um, it's not domesticated, so it's not, you know, it's not slaughtered in a, typically in a kosher manner. However, for use in sacred writings, the animal does not need to be um, shechted. It does not need to be slaughtered in a kosher manner. It just has to be a kosher species. It can have died in any manner. Um, of course, a natural death would be the most ideal. And Nancy, that's not, it, it doesn't necessarily answer entirely to, entirely to vegans. Um, however, if there was the possibility of using the animal skin when the animal had already died of natural causes, perhaps there would be less of an issue than the, the animal having been slaughtered. It's also, by the way, um, not halakhically acceptable to kill an animal in order to use its skin for sacred writings. It has to have been slaughtered for food and then you can use the, the skin or have died of natural causes. Again, not many animals die of natural causes these days. Unfortunately, though I do have a little bit of a secret um, desire to make roadkill tefillin, a lot of deer in these parts get hit by cars and it's just, you know, it's, be, it's a shame. I just wonder what happens to those uh, yeah. deer. Um... It's very interesting. I, I remember a while back there was a scribe that would, the word was going around that there was a scribe in Sfat in Israel that was doing quote unquote um, vegan tefillin that was trying, that was using exclusively um, animals that were died, died of natural causes and using skins from that uh, specifically for the community that didn't want animals that were killed uh, at all um, in that manner. Yes. Um, and I know some people are interested in using a, a plant source paper, it would not halakhically be considered um, kosher. However, um, neither necessarily depends how you look at the halakha would, um, this is a that's written by a woman. So, you know, that's something that each person can decide for, for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, Excellent. So, uh, onto the ink. Onto the ink. Where so, do you get to the ink? Yeah. This is a bottle of ink. I always want to, when I see the screen and it's not quite in the, <laughs> Frame. I, I move it the other way. Okay. <laughs> there we go. As long as you're not writing, because you're writing in the wrong direction, that's the problem. <laughs> I don't think that's the problem here. <laughs> so this is 
a company in Israel, they make the ink. There are no ingredients listed. The ink does not have to have necessarily specific ingredients, so it's a, it's a gall ink, and that means it's made from uh, gall nuts in chemical combination with iron sulfate. So what's a gall nut? A gall nut forms when wasps lay eggs on, a, on certain trees, and it's kind of a response of the tree to make this kind of this like ball. Um, and actually have, maybe I'll show that picture, share my screen. So on the top left are the balls that are formed. And on the bottom right, you see what's inside the ball, which is a wasp larva. And the wasp larva, once it turns, once it grows into a wasp and it flies out, it makes a little hole in that ball and it flies out. And the residue of what's left is crushed up. The, those balls are crushed up and then combine, and combined with iron sulfate and there's a chemical reaction and it becomes like a very black soot. And that's the base of the ink. And the ink has also other ingredients. It has um, gum arabic, kind of makes it sticky. Um, and it can have vinegar. I, I, think my, I think it has vinegar because I smell it or something vinegar-like. It can have wine, it can have pomegranate juice. It can have anything that's plant-based. Um, it cannot have anything not kosher, so it cannot have squid ink, for example, though squid ink would be black, but that's not permissible to use. So if you had access, for example, to Vantablack, uh, that new uh, black pigment that is blacker than black, that if you paint it on the floor, it looks like a hole. Have you seen this? It's completely no. non-reflect. Never heard of this? This is the latest no. technology. Oh. There's this thing called Vantablack. It's very hard to get. It's apparently very expensive to make. It is the blackest substance known to man in the sense that if you paint it on a wall, um, there's no reflectivity back on it. So it actually looks like it's like things have vanished. Like a black hole. Looks like a black hole, yes. If you paint it on the floor, it will look like there's a hole in the floor, right? It's crazy stuff. Um, but in theory, if you have that and you mix it with, not, with kosher ingredients, you could make a Torah whose like, letters look like they're falling into nothingness. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be Amazing. Trippy. That would be trippy. Anyways, um, so um, back to the practicalities. You bought, you have your ink, you have your, um, you have your, um, your, your cloth, your parchments. You write with a quill, right? And that is a technical requirement, right? And that it cannot be. No. It's actually it cannot... not, it's not a technical requirement. Ooh. Could you write with a fountain pen, for example? Mm -hmm. Okay. Technically speaking, yes. Technically speaking, you could write with anything. Um, this is, I'm showing a quill. This is, I write with a turkey feather. Ooh. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, the turkey feather does not come pre-cut as a pen. Um, so it's closed, you know, at first, and then I, I cut it and cut, you know, you have to learn sort of how to cut it. There are different methods and also everyone has their personal preference for what the quill feels like and how um, basically, it's, it, it's somewhere on the scale, the scale of how much control you have versus how much ink flow you have, and somewhere in between those. Some, some people prefer more ink flow, some people prefer more control. Um, but actually, you can write with anything. The, um, originally, the, I mean, the first instrument was reeds, and some sofrim still write with reeds, especially some Sparty sofrim. And you could also, they, they make nowadays these resin nibs uh, made from plastic. And halakhically speaking, that is perfectly acceptable. They're not as good. Um, but for people who have a hard time cutting quills or it's just faster, um, that, that works for them. And why can't you use a metal calligraphy nib? You can. You can. Um, so why did you can. that's there... be like my, I, I'm a fountain pen user. I have dozens of fountain pens. And I mean, I know the, the, the qualities of my various nibs. I can imagine that if I had one with a reservoir filled with ink in the back, I could just write and write and write and write. Yeah. So there has traditionally been this, an idea and a Masoret, a tradition that you don't use metal on Torahs. But that was at a time when metal was primarily associated with war. 
And now metal is also, or I would say even primarily associated with healing and with like with, with surgery. And we literally use surgical blades to correct mistakes and to cut the quills. So, and also halakhically speaking, it would, it, that would be fine to use a metal nib, though it's, oh. again, it's not, it's not typical. Interesting. So I, I would, I would add to that and I would say, well, some of the best nibs in the world are made from gold because of the, the pliability of it and gold would never be used in war. So maybe right. writing with a gold nib would be, uh, would be interesting. Yep. I've heard um, of now okay. some people making ceramic nibs. That I've never seen in a fountain pen, but maybe for so from, uh, I've seen that in knives, I've seen ceramic knives, but anyways. Um, you said something very uh, off the cuff there um, about making mistakes and you use metal to correct mistakes. Um, you write and write and write and write all day. What happens? You, you put in an extra vav or you uh, skip out uh, a lamid. Yeah. Um, what do you do? Okay, so, and I also saw a, a question in the chat that we can go to right now. So I'm copying from another Torah. I have to be copying from another Torah. I can't do it by memory, even if I know that passage by heart. Um, this little booklet, it's a tikkun. It's, a, it's called a tikkun for Sofrim. So it's actually just a scanned copy of a handwritten Torah and has little notations that help me along with the alignment, etc. cetera. Um, and if I make a mistake, and I do, and it's pretty much impossible, I think, to get through an entire Torah without making a mistake. There are over 300,000 letters. Um, Essentially, you scratch off the dry ink and you rewrite the letter. I mean, you could use a little bit of sandpaper and some gum sanderac and um, white eraser to prepare the parchment again. But there's not a problem fixing mistakes. There sometimes is a problem fixing mistakes, depending what the mistake is. But generally speaking, if I forgot a vav or needed to add a vav, that is done pretty easily. Someone proofreads. Uh, my work. And these days, also, you can have a computer proofread. So I took pictures, this Safer Torah that I almost finished, uh, the, the, CM, this, the completion ceremony was supposed to be April 3rd in Westchester. That was all put on hold. Um, I sent a picture of every column to my colleague, Jen Taylor Friedman, who has this computer program. Neighbor. Yeah, your neighbor. And um, and then I got a report from the computer and it showed me all of the mistakes, all of the, all of the things um, that I needed to fix. And so I'd go back and fix them. Occasionally you can't fix mistakes. So for example, if I skipped a line and didn't realize it and kept going, I can't scratch off that whole column. It will look terrible. Um, I, I actually, I want to show this, this image, there was a project, oop, where did it go? Oop. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. No. There we go. There we go. Okay. That was it. <laughs> so there was a project to handwrite the entire Christian Bible. It's called the St. John's Bible. And it was all illuminated as well. So one of the scribes, they, they made the decision to do the illumination first, apparently, at least on some of the pages, which um, was a problem because this scribe did exactly what I was talking about, accidentally skipped a line. But what did they do here? So the line is added at the bottom, and then they drew a little birdie that goes from the line up above, and the beak is pointing into the spot where the line was supposed to go. Now... We cannot do that in a Sefer Torah. <laughs> no, <laughs> there are no, in the Torah. no images in Sefer Torah. So, so I would have to, I would have to rewrite that column, possibly that whole area, that whole sheet of four columns, depending okay. um, where the mistake was. And also another time I might not be able to make, to fix a mistake is if I made a mistake on a name of God. So you can't scratch out the name of God. So then that has to become Shemo to start to right. get easy. I mean, there's certain, Kind of depending what mistake you made and which name of God, there are ten names, ten different names of God. I, it, you, there may be a way to fix it and deal with it, but there may not be. So it, you'd have to look. It, there's a couple of there are a couple of chapters on on this issue. So. Interesting. Um, you mentioned something when you were showing us the tikkun um, that you have notations in there. 
um, that help you with alignment and stuff like that. Um, can you tell us just a couple of like hints or details about like the things that you think about as a scribe that we might take for granted or we don't even realize is happening, but that is a fundamental importance for you. And I expect liberal use of the word kerning here, for example. K sorry? <laughs> kerning. <laughs> kerning? Yeah. What's that? You don't know what kerning is when you, when you have the lettering and the, 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 the alignment of how close you space letters versus how far you part oh, Anyways, I, but anyway, now, what other now, things? Yes, that is important, though <laughs> I never put a word to it. There you go. What, are the, <laughs> what other things do you think about that we would otherwise take for granted in a, in a big way um, with regards to being a scribe? Right. So I do think a lot about the alignment um, and the kerning. Because you can't, if you've seen a Torah, you see that the columns are aligned perfectly, right? And you can, ne you never see like half a word with a dash and then the rest of the word on the next line, right? So you have to either fit that word in, so squish it, or you have to extend a word out. So for example, there are only certain certain letters that can be extended. You cannot extend a gimel a or, or a, a mem. It won't, it won't look like that letter anymore, right? but you can extend a lamed or a dalid. So sometimes I actually write backwards because if there's no stretchable letter in the last few words, and I don't know exactly how much space I have left, I'll, I'll go to the end of the line and write backwards to the last stretchable letter if I know that there's gonna be extra space. And that's allowed and that's kosher. That is allowed and that's kosher. You can't write a name of God backwards, but other than that, you can write backwards. There is, you have to pay more attention though, because again, someone who speaks Hebrew, is much more likely to make a mistake when they're writing backwards. Mm -hmm. um, so you sort of have to like say the letters out loud and not, not necessarily the words. By the way, all the words have to be spoken out loud before they're written. Um, and um, let's see, what else do I think about when I'm going? Um, whenever, whenever I buy a, a, a verse in a Torah and I know the scribe, I have him call me. I've had this like a couple times so that we can read out the verse together. That's sweet during that time that like when it gets to my verse. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I, I do, I am very attuned to what it is that I'm writing, that is the content that I'm writing. Um, there's kind of like two channels going. One is the, the meaning and um, where I am in the Torah. And the other is kind of the technical elements. And what, what you talked about spacing, when the spacing, that is so important and it really um, is connected to the rhythm of the writing as well. And there's, um, my one of my teachers, Izzy Pludwinski, who wrote this oh. book. Um, Izzy, by the way, not that you're not a wonderful scribe. I consider him like the greatest living. Uh, so, oh, so he stam. Yeah, he is. He mostly doesn't work as a so far stam. He works as a calligrapher and he's very um, he, he has training also in Japanese calligraphy. And I mean, he's just he I'd say he's like the world renowned, most world renowned Hebrew uh, calligrapher. But you should also, check out his website. Everybody up here should check out his website. It's IMP Writer, like imp, uh, impwriter.com. Um, beautiful, beautiful art pieces. He is just. Someone's asking to show the book again. It's called. This it's book available came out on Amazon. A couple years ago, a few years yep. ago. Mastering Hebrew Calligraphy. Anyway, he talks about, in terms of rhythm and spacing, the spacing is not necessarily, the spacing that is equal between letters and words is not necessarily the right spacing because there's the optics that go along with it. So if you have an open letter um, before a, 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 another open letter, it will look more, it will look like there's more space in between. So you have to kind of deal with like the optics of spacing. It's very, it's very scientific. The art is very scientific. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, before we get back, go a little more to the art piece of it. Um, tell, us, tell us the whole thing about mikvah. Mikvah. Yeah, so there is a, there is, it's funny, this is a big, um, big topic. It's a, it's a big, I think, myth um, that has spread, which is the myth that you have to go to the mikvah before writing a name of God. Um, so mikvah is definitely something that's recommended for Sofrim. I personally go as like bookending a project. So I go before I start and when I finish. Um, you know, in theory, like going every day would be great, just not necessarily uh, totally practical and not, and not halakhically required at all. Um, there was a, a question in the chat. Are there scribes that actually do it before we get to that question? I, I personally don't know of any. <laughs> I remember um, 
Yeah, I remember in yeshiva that the urban legend was that there were two types of Torahs. It was like an average Torah where the mikvah, where the sofer went to the mikvah every day. And then there was like super premium Torahs where the sofer went to the mikvah every time they wrote the name of God. Okay, <laughs> I've heard of one Torah that falls into that category in spot. It must have taken like eight years to write because if you think about it's a lot some of pages, mikvah. you're writing in a name of God like, like 40 times. So by the time you get back from the mikvah, there's also... Interesting, some people also have this thing where they'll leave a space for name of God and then go to the mikvah and come back and write all the names of God. A whole bunch of names of God, interesting. And the, but it's the, the halakha, at least one of the halakhic sources says not to do this because it will look spotted. I remember that uh, the image that I used to have in yeshiva was that the, the sofa was writing in a towel, <laughs> <laughs> like next to the mikvah, so you could just like go dunk. Right. That would also be a little bit of a problem. <laughs> I, I can imagine. Um, and this is for men and for women, right? Mikvah, in right. terms of this way? Okay. Um, you said you had a question in the chat that I don't know. Oh, think I, um, yeah. I, think I, I think I addressed that. Let's see, there's other things here. Um, have I, do I get carpal tunnel? Um, no, my, but I have to take care of my wrist. I, I wear a brace sometimes overnight. I do feel it if I write too much. Um, have I ever done micro a Torah in micro Hebrew. No, not in very, not very small. Um, the smallest I've done is 7.5 millimeters between each line. That means the, the height of each letter is about 3.25 millimeters, which is small, but not micro. Um, I remember a sofer telling me that it's actually much harder to write small than it is to write big. Much harder to write small. And people think, oh, these tiny little Torahs, like whatever. And then you don't realize that the big Torahs are the, uh, are, are, are the beginner Torahs and they're like, you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're, I, yeah. I saw a safer Torah once that was the height of uh, like a typical mezuzah, like very, very small. It must have taken that so far years. I mean, I can't imagine. Um, uh, let's see, mikvah for scribes is specific to women. No, mikvah for scribes um, is general. I mean, at the time that the halakha was written, it was, you know, for men specifically, um, though, if you know, if we're looking at the halacha in general, it would, you know, we would look at it for everyone. But, um, but you're probably thinking about you're probably combining in your head mikvah women that go to mikvah for nida reasons. So after um, they finish men menstruating and wait uh, the white days, and then go to the mikvah, and then are then can reengage in sexual relations with their husbands. That this is a different purpose for mikvah, like a different reason for going to mikvah to do it more like spiritual. Well, uh, there may be multiple reasons for the, for the mikvah, but, um, you know, maybe both physical, but also spiritual, um, readiness. Um, a bunch of things are coming into the chat. Avi, should I just read these? Well, we got a bunch of them done already. Um, okay. then, um, can you um, just, you know, there's one here, but that it takes around a year and a half to complete a Torah. Would that be the same time ancient Torahs took or have there been advancements to speed things up? I don't think things have sped up very much, honestly. So can we, uh, I want to use that to transition to, um, to the future of scribe writing, of, of writing sure. scribally. Um, where do you think, I mean, this is clearly something that hasn't changed much in probably 1500 years or so, 2000 yeah. years since we have Masechet Sofrim, which is, you know, already a rabbinic text talking about the nature of writing. Um, I can't imagine that there's a lot of future advancement, advancements in the technology other than speeding up the checking with computer checking and other things along those lines. This is still by, by design a painstaking handwritten, you know, it reminds me of, um, you know, there's a, there's a project to slow down time. They call it the, uh, the, ch the, the Church of the Long Now, where they're building a 10,000 year clock that mm. takes many, many rotations and it's a whole thing. And by design, it is not designed to be sped up. It's designed to be slowed down, to have that and to maintain that, that sort of rhythm. Um, mm. So is there anything in the future that you're seeing that like we can, we can imagine? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, I think, interesting. I, I, it, I don't, I wouldn't say that it was designed from the beginning to be like a slow process. It was simply the only manner that we had of writing anything down. Um, and when there was, with the advent of the printing press, there was a, a push and a question as to whether Torah scrolls should be printed um, there. And there are a lot of advantages to that now. And some rabbis 
uh, came on this came down on the side of, of wanting to accept those as holistically viable but um, but the majority and then sort of the direction that we went is to keep to maintain the handwritten scroll so I think that the meaning of the Torah scroll has shifted over time and what it means to have a handwritten document right because now handwrite writing by hand is something that is seen as, spect as spectacular or like very different um, whereas before it just was just what it what it was. Um, I don't think we will. I don't think we will go in the direction of mechanical uh, Sifri Torah, but I meaning um, mass produced. Though I could be wrong. I, there are some. There is a small group that is pushing for um, screen printing. Is that silk it? Screen, silk yeah, screen, silk screen Torahs. Yeah. So they've sort of figured out a way because there's certain precise halachot about about usually about kavana about intention and names of God specifically. And so they've sort of, they've written about how their method of the silk screening gets around these issues. But I, I think that there is um, also a sentimental uh, mm -hmm. issue along with the halakhic questions that, that people are attached to the idea of this very individualized and unique um, handwritten scroll. And also the fact that it takes so long and you have to pay someone for their time, it, it, the, the object itself has more material worth, right? Um, so you end up, I think, taking care of it better. And so that has an impact too on how we relate to the scroll. Interesting. Um, I want to wrap things up, but I want to give you a chance. Is there anything that you think that you normally give a presentation about that is essential that we haven't yet covered, first of all? We've nope. got a lot of it, okay. Um, tell, tell us like one or two of the most offbeat, and I'm sure you've been preparing this for three weeks because we've been asking everybody. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, what are the, what, what, what's like something that happened that you were like, oh my goodness, I couldn't believe that this happened, but it happened. That was amazing. Or a request that you've received. Oh, gosh. You know, have you received a, you know, well, someone, was, someone once asked if I would, if I was interested in writing a Torah in exchange for land somewhere in Michigan. <laughs> uh, so I thought, I was like, well, how about you sell the land for money and I'll exchange you a Torah for money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then, you didn't need that. You, you, so you don't have land in Michigan. I do not saying. have land in Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, any other like requests that have come up, like for for something like pink fill-in for a bat mitzvah girl? Oh <laughs> no, that's funny. Um, no, I mean I would like to write a purple Torah, but I like you know it's because I like purple, but you know not not going to happen. Well, um, unless you figure out a way to tan the the the, the parchment, you know, the, like I when I the, the the congregation I used to be at uh, was Sephardic, and they they had um uh, they had uh, Torahs from the old country that were written on deerskins that actually look they they had that maroon look, right? And, uh, yeah, they become oxidized. That's yeah. it's gvil. Gvil. That's a whole other, yes, it's a whole. It, it yeah, feels like leather. Other. Feels like thick leather. Yeah. Um, it's the full. It's the full skin as opposed to the sliced, the yeah. like thinner skin. So, so maybe we can figure out a tanning way where the natural tanning brings out a, a purple tone purple. to the Torah. Huh? Love it. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, well, thank you so much for running this and session. Thank you so much <laughs> for uh, guesting this session. Um, and thank you everyone for being here. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Next week we have. Um, yeah. Richard Rapkin, who oh. is um, talking about um, uh, Kashrut. He is the managing director of the COR, the, uh, the major uh, Kashrut organization in Toronto and for much of Canada. Um, right. And we'll learn about what it means to get things certified kosher and the day-to-day -day work of that.